Let's see. I think we're I think we're live. All right. Let's uh, get this going here. Um. Hello. Okay. Here we go. <coughs> so just a few more notes about probability. This shouldn't be terribly long, I guess. Well, there's not much content to cover, but that doesn't mean I can't talk about it for a while. Let's talk a little bit more about independence and dependence. Let's think conceptually what's going on here. Are these two things independent of each other, being a U.S. senator and being black? Now, theoretically, they should be independent of each other, but empirically, they're not. And I'll show you why. If a random senator is selected, they have a probability of 0 to 0 0.01 of being black. That is, there are not very many black senators in the United States. However, if a random U.S. citizen is selected, their probability is like 15% of being black. So whether you're, a, whether you're a senator or not, so if you are a senator, you have a low probability of being black. If you're not a senator, you have a much different probability of being black. So being a senator is, is one event, and being black is another event. And if you know the out and the outcome of one of those changes the outcome of one of the others. So the outcome of one depends on the outcome of the other. So um, <coughs> some more examples here. Being in a car accident today and catching the flu today. I'm going to say those are probably independent. However, what if you caught the flu and that made you be in the accident? I don't know. But most people who get the flu, it doesn't make you get in a crash, I hope. But it seems kind of independent to me. Um, how about this one? Being from the Rio Grande Valley and being female. Does being from the Rio Grande Valley, like if we say, yes, I am from the Rio Grande Valley, or no, either one, if you pick one of those, does that change what a person's best estimate should be of whether you're female or not? I don't think it should. I think I, I checked some census records, and the, the sex split is pretty similar in the valley as it is in the rest of the country. So, no, those should be independent. Being from the Rio Grande Valley, yes or no, shouldn't change whether or not you're female, it, it doesn't change the probabilities. We're sort of talking about if you know the outcome of this, does it help you guess the outcome of the other one? If you know the outcome of whether a person is from the Rio Grande Valley, it doesn't actually do anything to help you understand and guess or make a better guess of whether a person is female. So that's why I would say those two things are independent of each other. Uh, let's, let's look at another example here, and this one I'm going to present a little differently. So fake data that I made up off the top of my head Let's say you, you collect data from, from a group of people on two variables. So this is one group of people, 170 people, and two variables, whether they're male or female, so their sex, and then their party identification, Democrat, Republican, or independent. Is, so when we ask the question here, we're going to say, are the variables independent of each other? Is party in identification, is that independent of the person's sex? So let's think about it. Maybe give it a pause. I'm going to move on here. Let's look at this a different way. Let's look at percentages, either row or column, whichever one works. We have row percentages here. So let's look at the row percentages of, being ma of, of the males. 70% of them are Democrat, about 19% of them are Republican, 11% of them are independent. But for the females, 43, 44% are Democrat, 25 Republican. So we can compare any of those two things, and actually we should compare all of them together, but you can start with any of them, and you can say, are these things different? So looking at these numbers, one of the things you can say to yourself, these are row percentages, so these are the percentages of identification for males, they all add up to 100%. These are the percentage for females, they add up to 100%. Um, 70% of males are Democrats, 43% of females are Democrats. So you could ask yourself, if I knew whether a person was male or female, would that help me guess what their party affiliation was? Well, yeah, it would. It doesn't have to make it certain that you would guess correctly, but it, it has to shift the odds. So if you're a gambling person, you understand this concept. Shifting the odds, it helps in the long run. You, you go with the odds, right? So if a person was male and you knew this data, you should guess that they were Democrat most of the time. If a person was female, well, you should guess a little more often than not that they were not a Democrat. So males have 70% chance of being a Democrat. Females have about 44%. Th that seems like a pretty reasonably large difference there. Um, so last year I gave a survey to my class, and so I said, being in Section 1 
of the class, I was teaching two, two classes, uh, was that independent of wearing a synthetic fiber on the day of the survey? So one of the first days of class, we did a little survey with silly information in it that we could analyze. So here we go. Section 1 versus 2, and natural versus synthetic fiber. So look at that for a minute and see if you can figure out whether those two variables, set the section you're in versus the type of fabric you were wearing on, the f on that day, whether those two things are independent. Let's break it down and look at some percentages. Um, I did column percents this time, so 23 plus 4 is 27, 85 percent plus 15 percent is 1. So of the people in section 1, 85 percent were wearing natural fibers, 15 percent were wearing synthetic fibers. Of the people in section 2, 86 natural and 14 percent synthetic. Those are really close. 85 and 15 and 86 and 14, those are some really very close numbers. I think. Uh, I wouldn't think that you would have much of an advantage in guessing what kind of fiber a person was wearing based on which section they were in. So I would say those two variables, the fiber fabric you were wearing and which section you're in, are independent. So moving on now, let's talk a little bit about continuous distributions. We've been looking at histograms a bit, and I hope you've had some practice with histograms. Um, it's up to you to make sure you know this stuff, so make sure you practice with histograms. They're pretty important. Let's look at some fake data. Let's look at years that a person has spent on the job according to a fake, really, really big survey that has like 150,000 people in it or something like that. Most people have less than 10 years on the job, then a few people 10 to 20 years on the job. Not very many people have been working at the same job for 20 to 30 years, and a teeny, 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 or zero percentage, 30 to 40 years. So if we do a histogram that just has five bins, then we're breaking it up by 10 years. 0 to 10, 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40. If we drew a line across the center tops of those bars, it would be kind of a downward line like that. And it would have these big bends in it. Now, what if we made 10 bins so that there's only 5 years per bin, 5 years per bar in this histogram? Now it's less chunky, right? And now we can see that actually the line should go up on the left before it goes down. But it's still a big, jagged line. There's the line. And what about 20 bins? Now we have a bin every, what is it, two years, something like that. Now it's looking more smooth. And if we connect the tops of those bars, there we go. And now if we do 30 bins, now I don't know what we're doing. We're like a year and a, a, year and a few months per bin. Now it's even more smooth. The bins are not as obvious in some places. 50 bins even more smooth. A hundred bins, now we're getting a really smooth curve. Are you seeing where this is going? You could, if you could have millions and millions and millions of people in your survey, and here's 500 bins, and there's a line probably, I mean, it's a little jagged and pixelated, but that's more because it's a computer than because you can actually see the tops of the bars. So if you had some sort of a variable that you could mes measure with infinite precision, so this is, I don't know, like <laughs> every week <laughs> that you've been on the job. It's this fake made-up data. So there's a bin for every week. So this person was 10 years, and this was 10 person was 10 years in one week. Um, and these people in this bar here. So if you could measure something with infinite precision, with infinite number of breaks between every number, purely continuous variable, and you had an infinite number of people or observations, so you, had, so you could always have frequency or density, then you would have a continuous frequency distribution. And these continuous frequency distributions, you can imagine them as being a histogram that has, that has bars that have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller, and there are millions and millions of bars until you have an infinite number of bars, and they're all infinitely skinny. The real data, just, to, just for kicks and giggles, I'll show you the real data from um, the general social survey, which we might play with later in the semester, I'm not sure. Um, <coughs> Excuse me. It's it's much more messy. It looks nice like this, but as we go more and more bins, it's it's pretty jagged. And that's because real data doesn't play nicely like pure theoretical curves do. But if we had infinitely thin bars, then there are some interesting consequences of this, and that's the point of this part of the lecture. These are called continuous distributions, and we talk about them a little differently from histograms. Now, for one thing, you can't ever know what percentage of 
observations have exactly this value. So you could never say, what percentage of people have been on the job exactly 10 years? What you can say is, what percentage of people have been on the job between 10 and 20 years? So we can talk about the probabilities or the areas of ranges of observations in the distribution. Now an important thing to learn is that in these distribution, area is probability. So let me go back and show you a quick example here. Let's get back to here. So if I say what's the probability of a person being on the job between 10 and 20 years, the answer to that is to draw a perfect line here and draw a perfect line here and then figure out the area of this chunk of the distribution. If this was a histogram, you'd just count up the percentages or the frequencies represented by all these bars. You'd, you'd add up the heights of the bars, right? But because the bars are infinitely thin, you'd need calculus to do that. And instead of calculus, we have R. And there are tables. But we're going to be doing a lot of that, finding areas under curves. Um, we'll just look things up in tables, which I don't like doing, or we'll use R, which is much easier. It, there's a simple little function to find areas under a variety of different curves in R. So skipping along, in any density function or a continuous distribution, the probability of any specific value is zero because the bar is infinitely skinny. It has no area. It has height, but no area. But you can figure out the density, in other words, the height of the bar at that point. But that's, that's not quite the same as the probability. So instead, we look at probabilities of ranges of values. So we say, what's the probability of selecting an observation between this and this, or above this value, or this value, or lower? We can answer those questions. So what's the probability of, a, of finding a person in this crowd who is between the ages of 25 and 17, or who is under the age of 12? We can answer those questions using continuous distributions. And we do that a lot. Let's see why this is kind of useful. We'll see a little example. Assume there's a distribution of SAT scores. Now, this is the old school SAT scoring. I think they've changed to a new two digit scoring. In the olden days, like a couple years ago, it was uh, at the SAT, each of the scales had a distribution that was normal, and it still is very normal, but it, it was scored so that the mean was 500 and the standard deviation was 100. And in normal distributions, there's a beautiful, beautiful property that if you know the standard deviation and the mean, then you can figure out the area under any part of the curve as long as you count starting at the mean and you count in chunks that are some fraction of, of standard deviations. So if you use the standard deviation as a measuring stick starting at the mean, which is in the middle, then you can figure, this, figure out the area under any part of the curve. That's one reason why people like the normal curve so much, because it behaves so nicely. And the SAT scores are pretty close to normal in their histogram, in their distribution. So imagine the perfect, beautiful normal distribution here. Um, what's the probability of selecting a score above the median? Well, a normal distribution is symmetrical. It's that perfect bell-shaped curve, right? The median is the exact middle. So the median is the mean, since it's symmetrical. And so the probability of selecting a score above the median is like saying a probability of selecting a score on the right half of the number line. So we just figure out the area under the curve. Now we pretend like the whole area is 1, so all the areas under the curve are always some proportion. So the probability is 0.5 of selecting a score above the median, because half of the scores are above the median and half are below. Um, what's the probability of selecting a score above Q3? The Im <laughs> or above the 90th percentile. So above Q3, Q3 is the place where by definition 20% or sorry, 25% of the scores are higher, right? So the probability of selecting a score above Q3 is 0.25. Because 25% of the scores, 25% of the area under the normal curve is above that point. We don't, I don't know what that point is. I didn't calculate it. But we know that the probability is 0.25. Above the 90th percentile. Remember, at or above in a perfect continuous distribution is the same as just saying above. Because the bars are infinitely thin. If you think about it, that makes sense. So what percentage of the scores are above the 90, 90th percentile? Then that uh, should be 10%. should be 10% of the bars above or at the 90th percentile. So the probability of randomly selecting somebody from a crowd who has a score in the top 10% is 
So let's say five random people tell you that they all scored in the 90th percentile on the SAT. What's the probability of that happening? Well, you can use the AND rule. You know the probability of anyone, any one person randomly, I said random for that, telling you that they scored up in the 90th percentile. 90th percentile means 90 or above. Then if the probability of any one person scoring there or above is 10%, the probability of five people doing that is the first person scoring there and the second person and the third person. So it's, it's 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 times 0 0.1. The probability that five random people that you meet would all be scoring above the 90th percentile, if it was truly random, a random sample of all SAT takers, would be insanely small. So either people are lying to you or you're dealing with, I don't know, the honor students on campus or something, in which case it's much more likely that that might happen. All right, and that's where I'm going to end.